Okay, let's dig into this. Obviously, we're going to be talking about optimizing your training for faster strength and hypertrophy gains, which I'm 100% sure you are interested in doing. So let's go with it. What we will be covering in this video presentation is the basic movement patterns that you should be including in your training week. So you can optimize your training for maximum return on investment of your time in the gym. Most of us are time limited, so it makes sense to ma maximize exercise choice so you can speed up the process of growing muscle and getting stronger. We want to choose exercises that create the most amount of disruption to the muscular, skeletal and nervous system. The magic is in the basics and I want to show you how to categorize basic, movement pa basic movements on their biomechanical demands. Once you determine which basic movement patterns are essential for the purpose of strength and hypertrophy gains, then you can utilize a pool of exercises forged from those movement patterns. When needed, you can rotate exercises and layer them appropriately based on their demands on the muscular, skeletal and nervous system. Obviously, we're going to be trying to look at this from a simple standpoint. And reason being is because I'd say 70 to 80 percent of most people in the gym are totally wasting their time simply based on exercise choice you're just doing the wrong stuff the wrong amount of it and if we can just like funnel all the shit away and get to the core of what you need to be doing then you can focus all your energy on actually progressing so exercise is just stimulus there are seven basic movements the human body can perform and all other exercises are merely variations of these seven so as long as we get our stimulus generally from this spectrum we will create enough stimulus to build strength and muscle mass. Obviously, the context of this, guys, is for strength and hypertrophy um, gains or muscle growth. Obviously, the body can move in very different ways if you're going to go into different avenues of um, practice or exercise, but we're obviously utilizing this context, right? So don't come at me about yoga and other stuff, right? Anything outside of these seven, I would argue you are wasting your time unless it's purpose is to fix an issue related to the larger main basic movements, right? Let's get my head out of the way so we can see what's going on. Motor unit recruitment is the process by which different motor units are activated to produce a given level and type of muscle contraction. Motor units play a significant part of that adaptation process that you want to stimulate during exercise. When you first start strength training, your brain responds by recruiting more and more motor units every time you contract the muscle. Also, as you develop and you develop your training experience, you, de you develop the ability to generate more force and your motor units fire at a more rapid pace. However, mechanical loading is the primary mechanism by which hypertrophy occurs with metabolic stress also playing a role. So on the left here, we have a famous graph from Charles Francis and it's the percentage of an athlete's total motor unit um, involvement in different activities and also when we're looking at training everything lives on a spectrum as in nature anyway but so does it in training and when we're looking at this motor unit recruitment all of the uh, most beneficial exercises live on a spectrum and this is it so towards the left where we have 100% recruitment we're going to have high force um, high effort maximal effort movements and you're going to have a velocity in there as well and that's where we have things like snatch clean maximal sprinting explosive movements like plyometric jumps obviously with those movements there's more of a um, force production and performance related um, adaptation you're still going to get some hypertrophy adaptations but again we're talking with when we put things along a spectrum right then towards the um, coming down to 70%, 75%, 60%, we're going to get things more like squats, deadlifts, um, and any movements that are similar to that, because we're still going to get that performance element, and we're still going to recruit a lot of motor units, but we're going to get a lot of hypertrophy adaptations as well. So you can clearly see along the spectrum where you should be putting most of your effort when you're training, because this is where you're going to get most of the adaptations that you want if those adaptations are strength and hypertrophy right and obviously further down the chain you're going to get upper body stuff like bench press lat pull down and then we're going to come down the end towards iso isolated uh, movements 
And also this relates to fatigue management as well. So if you're doing things that are towards the left and recruiting a lot of motor units, they're gonna be neurally fatiguing to the body. And we have to factor that in when you're selecting your exercise choices. You can't just hammer yourself all the time or you're just gonna keep redlining yourself and you're not gonna get the benefits from it. So there has to be a balance and you've gotta live on the spectrum and manipulate the spectrum so you can actually keep progressing, right? And if we can move forwards. Right, so to maximize hypertrophy and strength adaptations, we want to focus our exercise pool on movements or exercises that recruit the most amount of motor units, but also place an emphasis on mechanical load or the potential for that exercise to be loaded. Right, and that is where a lot of people just fuck things up because the potential for the exercise choice you have for it to be loaded is shit, right? Always go for the exercise that has the most potential for loading especially if your main goal is strength and hypertrophy and especially if the exercise choice is the main thing so the dinner right you're going to have some starters you're going to have dessert but we have to focus on the main thing the main uh, exercise the main movement pattern that is driving the adaptation that you want right does that potential for loading um, is that potential for loading high or poor or low motor unit recruitment is a big part of the way in which the central nervous system of CNS controls force production in muscles. Each motor unit acts as the control system for a group of muscle fibers. If the CNS detects that more force is needed, more motor units are recruited to move the load, recruiting high threshold motor units and thus being more fatiguing to the nervous system. This training stimulus induced fatigue is what creates strength adaptations once we apply adequate recovery. Maximal motor unit recruitment is achieved at high velocity movements like shown in the diagram on the left. Muscle growth is mostly determined by the mechanical load and experience by each muscle fiber during the exercise or movement. To achieve the necessary level of mechanical loading, contraction velocity must be both maximal and controlled. So at a controlled execution, usually applying some sort of tempo or pauses. This combination or gray area between motor unit recruitment and mechanical loading leads to enough simultaneous cross bridging forming in the muscle fibers controlled by high thresh motor units. This state can be achieved by either one, lifting heavy weights or two, lifting light weights to muscular failure. As we can see in the diagram opposite, this gray area aligns with movements like deadlifts, squats, presses and pulls. Sorry guys. These movements by nature allow a bridging between mechanical loading and control of velocity. Right, moving on to basic movement patterns. Right, this is not in any particular order. Um, it's just how I've set it up for today. And obviously there's gonna be some variations in terms of what exercises you can fit into those movement patterns. So number one, pull. Uh, it can either be vertical or horizontal. Obviously you'd like to incorporate both, but if you're time um, poor, then you can kind of, um, prioritize or basically swap in rotate between different weeks of training right so you're not missing anything right you're just rotating number two push vertical or horizontal and that also includes dips again you can rotate movements if you're poor on time squat considered to be one of the most complex movements the human body is capable of within the gym obviously environment variations of the squat include obviously the barbell back squat goblet squats front squats split squat variations of any sort so swift machine dumbbells body weight yada 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 and obviously zerka squats will be included in there as well number four the lunge this movement places greater demands on flexibility stability and balance variations include walking lunges forwards and reverse lunges side lunges or other planes of movement also step up step ups are classed as a lunge lunge is a very uh, very effective movement especially if you're not you don't want to load your spine or your um, you have some sports that you have to do during the week um, it still allows you to train your legs in a functional pattern and the loading potential is very high in lunges right so you can still get very strong and grow loads of muscle in your lower body okay moving on so number five is the hinge one of the most crucial movements uh, exercises in these groups are deadlifts with varying forms such as sumo deadlifts, conventional deadlifts, Romanian deadlifts, kettlebell deadlifts or swings. These exercises build a posterior chain which compromises of the hamstring, glutes and lower back. You can also do 
um, hinge in with the, like things and back extensions and stuff like that. As long as you're hinge in, you're obviously covering that movement pattern. Number six is rotation, a unique form of movement because of the plane that it works in. Rotation involves twisting at the core. This motion is underrated despite being essential for success in many sports. Rotation is seen while throwing a ball, kicking a ball, changing directions while running, and many other actions. The core, specifically the obliques and the hips and the spinal column are the main contributors to this set of movements. Exercises that can fall under this group are Russian twists, wood chops, and any torso rotation emphasis core movements. We also can imply, sorry, we can also we also can employ anti-rotation movements like side planks, variations, or anything like that. Do keep in mind, uh, to train the core effectively, we need to load it. So again, if you're working rotations or anti-rotation movements, again, we want to look at the potential for loading for the exercise. If the potential is low, it's probably not a good movement to be doing because it, there isn't a scope or a spectrum for you to progress it and apply loading so you can get stronger and actually develop strength and power and hypertrophy, right? Number seven, lastly, we have gait, which is the technique of walking. This might seem trivial, but walking is a fundamental movement. Gait is the combination of multiple movements involving lunging, rotating, and pulling with the hamstrings. Exercises that can be done in this group include jogging, jumping, plyometrics, and farmers walk, prowler pulls, or prowler pushes. Gait also comes into play with closed chain exercises like squats and deadlifts. How you contact the ground with your feet will have a huge role to play in how much you, how much how much load you can move and how well you can recruit motor units and muscle fibers. This topic exceeds this presentation, but it is worth reading about gait cycle. When um, going through feedbacks with clients or looking at how they're moving or the progress of the movement, progress of movement and exercise and how well they're developing or not, the first place I look is their feet because the feet tells you everything. And everything that happens at the feet usually travels up the chain. Right, finishing on session layout. So now we've accumulated that information, how do we apply that to a session and construct a productive session so we can progress and actually get some results? So sec I break things down into three parts or three sections of a session. So this is exactly what I do. And then I apply um, whatever goals we have to that uh, rough framework. There's a very rough framework and there's other things I apply to this, um, but we're not gonna discuss that today. So section one, this part of the session should focus on any of the blows. So any stretching or mobility work, priming for main movements, any weak areas to bring up or imbalances, CNS priming, plyometrics, technicality, anything you want to do at a lighter weight and work on, working on technique, core or glute stability. This part of the session is also a good place to put stuff that you can't be bothered to do at the end of a session. Right, if you want to focus on calves or you want to focus on core or stimulate an area, bring up a lagging body part, then put them at the start of the session so you get them done. Right? It's also a good area to just prime and get ready for the session or get ready for the main section. Number two, your main section for the session. This is where the meaty part of the workout gets done, the actual work, the work that drives neural and hypertrophic response and adaptations. Focus on the main movements, the main goal for the day. The intensity will be done here, so your load and volume, right? So moving on, section three, which is the final section of the session, which can focus on accessories, core, which should include spinal flexion, rotation, or isometric, any lagging body parts, imbalances, or conditioning you can put in there as well. Right, hope you've enjoyed that very short presentation, but it was a quick deep dive. Any questions, drop them in the comments below and I'll get back to you.